If you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask you to turn to Acts, Acts chapter 10, and we're going to begin reading in verse 34. Acts chapter 10, and we're going to begin reading in verse 34. Acts chapter 10 and verse 34, the Bible says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he feareth, in, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is the Lord of all. That word I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for all that you do for the church here at Dover. Lord, we pray that we'd be strengthened in your word this morning. Lord, that you would uh, look to us as ways that we could share your word more. God, we pray in the last days that we live that you would uh, cause us to be a witness unto you, Lord, that uh, we would be able to give great uh, glory and honor in the day which we live. Lord, we pray now for you, that your word would touch the hearts of the hearers, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise for it, for it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture, but most of what I've heard preach previous to this was the interaction between the Lord God and Peter in convincing Peter to go to a Gentile named Cornelius. Now, with all that settled, uh, uh, Peter is now at Cornelius' house and has presented the gospel, and Cornelius and most of the people in his house were saved. And so that's kind of where we're picking up in this, in this ministry to Cornelius. And if you remember, uh, Peter was very resistant to go. He did not want to go. He thought he was better than they were. And, and what this ought to teach us is that we're better than no one. Uh, a lot of times we get that mentality that because we're good, sovereign, grace Baptists, that uh, we're cut above and nothing further could be from the truth. And so with that said, John, I mean, excuse me, Peter learns a great lesson in verse 34, and Peter opened his mouth and said, of the truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Now, I want you to see that apparently prior to this, he believed that because he said, I perceive that he, he has no, uh, no, uh, uh, he, he places nobody above one or the other, and I perceive that the Jew is no better uh, than the Greek. And all through his life and through his ministry, you will find that Peter had an issue with this. And many times he would kind of regress and go back. And in fact, I think one occasion he wouldn't eat with the Gentile believers because he was a Jew. And uh, Paul said, I rebuked him to his face. And so uh, this became uh, an issue for Peter, but his first lesson, he learns not just that the Gentiles are, uh, uh, can providentially be saved, he says God has no respect for the anybody, and that should give us a great missionary zeal. Uh, verse 35, but in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted, <coughs> excuse me, accepted with him. So he, he goes even further, and if you, if you write in your Bible, underline that uh, every nation, because see, that gives us the credibility and the, uh, and the, uh, a bit, and the uh, instruction to go to every nation. That's why we are 
missionary Baptist. That's why we're not a primitive Baptist people, but rather we believe in the zeal of spreading the gospel because it's very particularly here, it's in all nations. And so it is our duty then to preach the gospel to everyone and let the Lord God take care of the rest. And Peter is finally beginning to uh, spiritually see that. Verse 37, the word I say, you know. Well, let me let me point out which one thing real quick, and then we'll move on. And uh, that uh, he uh, he complimented the people in uh, being fearful of the Lord God. Now uh, we live in a day and age. I perceive that few people fear God. Uh, you you want to know uh, why people go into schoolhouses and start shooting ram randomly? There's no fear of God. You know, at one time I thought, well, uh, if we would execute more of these people that that do these horrendous crimes, there would be no there would be more fear, and people would think about doing it. And, and that's not true. The the fact is not is it's not that they don't fear the government or or fear repercussions, they don't fear God. And when you don't fear God, there's nothing left. What more, what higher authority exists? None. And so if we don't fear God as a people, then uh, certainly there is no hope. So one thing that Peter wanted the Gentile believers to understand that the fear of God is the beginning. And so if we don't preach Christ, if we don't preach uh, the, God, the great God Jehovah, the pure Father, as hating sin, how does fear begin? I think it's an impossibility, don't you? Now, when we live in a day and age where the only God that pre is preached is a God of love, therein is no fear. And therein, there, there's no understanding of the person, of the person whom God is. So as it says in verse 35, uh, there's, there's in every nation though, those that fear him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. Now I want you to see there in that first part of 35, preaching peace. Now, for those of you that are saved, you should be some of the most peaceful uh, receptive, happy people in the world. Now we're not, yeah. but we ought to be. Yeah. Uh, uh, Adam just shared with us something that I didn't know, and uh, concerning uh, the the possibility of crude oil and fuel prices being impacted, and, and and some government entities outside ours doing some things. But you know what? Uh, that don't. That don't bring much fear with me because I know my God's able. I may not have what I have now, and it may soon be dissipated and gone away, but I know that God's on the throne. And if he, what, what is the rich, one of the richest Bible verses I know is all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to them that are called according to his purpose. So how possibly could we be upset? Uh, peace is a, peace is the result of the gospel. Yet in 2023, we see very little peace. We see people fretful. We see people upset. We, we see people wringing their hands. And why is this? Is it because God's people are sinful? I don't think so. I think it's because the devil is still out there. And, and we'll look at that closely, how he is what he does to the Lord's people. Not to, you know, uh, the devil, once you're saved, the devil don't stop. Uh, the, the, that's a farce. Uh, because, see, he, 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 I don't know if he understands he can't have your soul or not. Sometimes I'm not sure what the devil does understand and what he does not because he constantly comes up against God even though God's sovereign. So maybe his spiritual understanding, maybe we give him more credit than credit's due. 
You see what I'm saying? Maybe he don't understand the eternal security in Christ. Maybe he doesn't. And so because of that, he attacks us and attacks us and attacks us again. Don't think you're exempt because he will come your way. And, and so with that said, and as Peter is talking to these people, he reminds them that there should be peace, a lack of fear. But in every nation, he that feareth him worketh righteousness and is accepted with him. Verse 36, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. Notice this in parenthesis. He is Lord, Lord of all. Now, when we think of he is Lord of all, we think of every creature, maybe, maybe every person. But no, it goes deeper than that. He is Lord of all. Even the wind that blows in your face this morning, he is Lord of all. But, you know, if we would take just a moment to, to think about, we can praise him for even more, right? He is Lord of all. And I, I told this question, y'all remember when uh, Brother Ashley Hornsby got us lost out into the, the land of love owners on, and uh, we was on a, a missionary excursion, and back then, Justin Lackey walked like this all the time. And that, that's how he would get uh, where he was going. And you think he would watch what was there because that's the only place he watched. We was out there and then uh, log woods, he stepped exactly on the snake, right on the, and killed the snake, killed, and, and never even seen it. And I said, Justin, you just stepped on the snake. What? Uh, you know what? God was sovereign in that. It looked like a copperhead to me. You know what I'm saying? Even in that, God got glory. So you remember when you're under attack and when you're under uh, oppression that God is still God. Don't ever forget that he, he is the center of all things. He's Lord of all. If you can remember when you're being oppressed that God is greater, he will bless you for it. Uh, verse 37, this word I say you know was published throughout all of Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism that which John preached, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and, pow and with power who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Now, I want you to see one of the most horrific ministries and the devil does have ministries. Uh, one of the most horrific ministries of the devil is oppression. Making you oppressed. Making you where you're no longer motivated. Making you where you no longer feel strong in the Lord. Making you feel like a piece of wood floating down the creek. Making you feel not that, that not God's in control, but the circumstance is in control. Have you ever felt like that before? Boy, I have. And, and, and you almost convince yourself of that thing. So I want you to see that the, uh, the uh, ministry of oppression comes from Satan, and he's always done that. He's always wanted to oppress the children of God. How did the, uh, how did the uh, children of Israel get under the authority of Egypt? First of all, they rebelled against God. It is my full belief after the drought, they should have left. But they stayed there for 400 years. That, that, that's amazing to me uh, that a people could be out of the will of God so long. So then what came up in that time? An, op an oppressor, someone that would bring them down. The Pharaoh just wanting them constantly in the earth and demanding more and more and more of them. That's oppression. 
That, that's living under the gun. That, that is a very difficult situation to come from. And so we find that's of the devil. He brings that to us. He, uh, he puts us through that. Verse 39. And we are witness of all things which he did both to the, in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on the tree. Now, uh, Peter wanted to remind these folks that he was with, with Jesus through his whole ministry. He said, I've seen it all. I saw what was accomplished. I saw what was done. But I want you to see in that that he knew oppressions were there too. You know what? Every day is not going to be a good day. Uh, these health and wealth teachers, uh, they're going to tell you you're going to feel like a million bucks every day and have uh, uh, endless zeros in your bank account. Now, I have zeros in my bank account, but they're on the wrong side of the decimal, right? Uh, so that, that's simply not true. And, and when we take into that stuff, you know what? The result is oppression. They'll, they'll tell you, well, you're not believing enough. You're not trusting enough. No. The branch of oppression, of oppression is constantly doing that to God's people. He's constantly constantly bringing them down. Now look with me in verse 38 uh, with the oppression. Uh, you ever thought about what oppression or oppressed means where it says oppressed here? First word, uh, it means is persecuted. You ever feel persecuted? I do. Now, listen, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ here in the United States, they've not seen anything yet. We think we've been oppressed, but you know what? Um, he persecutes, the devil persecutes individually. He knows my buttons and he knows your buttons too. You see what I'm saying? He knows how to get you. Uh, I may know not. I may not know what's going on with you, and you may not know what's going on with me. But I'll guarantee you this: the devil understands. In fact, he pre-studies everybody. Remember, remember the servant Job, and the Lord God came to the devil and said, "Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth. He feareth God and escheweth evil." And what was immediate response from the devil? Has God served you for naught? You built the heads around him. Take his stuff away from him, and he will curse thee to thy face. How did the devil know that? He'd studied him. He knew Job was rich. He knew Job was a spiritually centered man. So all he needed was the, yeah, go for it. And he got it. He said, take everything he's got. And he'll curse, uh, take everything he's got. And we know that Job was faithful because he truly belonged to God. And so we see that first of all, this oppressed means persecution. It means downtrodden. In other words, been walked over by, by the forces of Satan, trampled down into the ground, Brought down to nothing. Uh, taken from your position. Abused. You, you ever been abused by the devil? You ever taken care of abused children? I have. Uh, foster care situation. You know uh, what I found about abused children is this. At the very best, they'll be able to manage it. And at the very worst, it will consume them. Mm -hmm. that, that's what I've learned. And you know what? You can be like that with the devil. He can bring you down to nothing. He can make you question your, question your salvation every day. And he can bring you down to nothing. He, he can literally bring you to the point where death looks better than life. 
That, that, that is what the oppression does to, to us as God's people. We're not exempt in any way. He, he attacks us as well. The last meaning of that word is tyrannized. Now, we don't know much about tyranny in the United States. We may get a little bit of that back. Uh, but tyranny is this. It's when the leader comes down on you so hard and just pushes you and pushes you till he gets you to what, where he wants you to be. Now, the good thing, if we'll remember, our God is sovereign, and the devil does not have a tyranny, although he wants you to convince him. But what does the Bible concern, say concerning of Satan? He is the prince and the power of the air. See, he, you, you ever wonder why things are going worse and worse here in the United States and all across the world? Well, the prince and power of the air is gaining power every day. And it's going to be worse and worse. It's not going to get any better. These health and wealth teachers, and I see them on Facebook all the time, and, and I don't really know how they come to the conclusion that they come to. And so we find this oppression happens every day. It uh, takes us to a lower and lower spot. Now, go with me to Acts 16, and we're going to begin reading. We're going to read verse 16 by itself, and then we're going to go a little further down. Uh, Acts 16 and verse 16, uh, one of my favorites, uh, because it shows the power of God. If you, again, know your Bible, the woman Lydia has just been saved. And Lydia extends a great welcome to, uh, to Paul and Silas and their missionary team and says, come and stay. If you've judged me faithful, stay in my house. Yeah, you don't see a whole lot of that anymore, do you? I don't think it's any wrong, uh, anything wrong with getting, getting a pastor, a good motel room and stuff, but... Uh, you see, Lydia meant business, didn't she? Mm -hmm. she? She wanted to see that they were taken care of. And, and, and so that had just occurred. Have you ever thought what the response of Satan is when someone is saved? He'll be after that man. The one that presented the gospel. The one that preached of the good tidings of the Lord Jesus Christ. That will be a natural response. Now, if you know your Bible, after this salvation occurred, uh, they, they were going down to the house of the Lord. They, I'm assuming the temple's still there, uh, not in Jerusalem, but where they were at, there was always a, uh, not a temple, uh, but a place where the Jews would meet. Verse 16, and it came to pass, as he went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, this spirit of divination is very much real. Uh, when people say they can predict the future, if they're in line with demons, probably it's well to be true. Uh, we minimize that too much as badness. Uh, Beware of people like that. Uh, avoid them with everything you've got. Now, I don't know how it is now because uh, I know the little county paper here at home don't do it, but y'all remember in the Leaf Chronicle, that's our big paper here at home. I don't even know if, I guess it's still out there. And they have the horse book in it. You know what that is? That's a spirit of divination. Exactly what it is. And you know, oh, but Brother Larry is accurate sometimes. Of course it is. It's a spirit of divination. Uh, of course it can hit home sometimes. That, that's what they do. And, and that's this type of woman. She had this spirit of divination, and, and she was a soothsayer. A soothsayer was an individual. Remember, uh, uh, Saul went to a soothsayer when he was no longer hearing from God to see if he ought to go up to the rebellious nation or not. And uh, she began to do her thing and trying to predict the future and get in contact with these wicked spirits. 
And all of a sudden she says, Thou art Saul, you have deceived me. How did she know that? Because it was real. That, that ungodly, wicked spirit revealed it to her. And, and so we see then, we as the Lord's people need to be very cautious of that mess. We need to warn others of it. And this was the type of individual that they were, uh, that they were dealing with. And in the interim, Paul turns and casts the demon out left her with nothing. Remember when Judas Iscariot, when it was all said and done, he, he was left empty too. Remember he went down to the temple and said, I betrayed the innocent blood. <laughs> and what did religion, what did the Jews say to him? What is that to us? You take care of that. <laughs> left him empty, didn't he? Bible says he threw the money at their feet and went out and hanged himself. And so now this woman, like every person that is possessed of a devil, is left empty and dry. And it made the people that was getting money off of her mad. You know what? People are not going to be thrilled when the Lord saves you. If you have Friends in the world, I'll put it that way. The church will rejoice with you. The redeemed will rejoice with you. But your friends in the world, they're not going to be doing jumping jacks and they're not going to be encouraged. They're going to do everything against you. Usually leave you high and dry, and that's what happened to this woman. And so with all that said and the money being gone, they were reported to the police. And we'll pick up to verse 20. And and brought them, meaning Paul and Silas, and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. Not excited about having a missionary couple there. Not excited about being preached of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, And teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. Now, I want you to see this, this approach, this, uh, the way that they presented it to God's people is not unusual. Uh, we'd be humbled to know of the people that went into strange lands and died for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, uh, people are not typically excited <coughs> to hear that their religion is empty and vile and useless. I found, I found that to be true. That they wanted, they, whether that be the most heathen there is, worshiping trees, or if they think salvation comes from a bucket of water, whatever their era is, they don't want to hear about it being uh, brought to nothing. And these folks didn't either, plus they uh, lost their money and no longer had this woman to sell out to tell fortunes and uh, they reported them. Verse 22, And the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrate rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. Now, I want you to see that in that day the results was much worse. Now, if you want to see people's reaction to the gospel, you get out where individuals where you're their game. When, and I still want to finish it one day about all of East Tennessee, but I preached in every county in the, uh, from Middle Tennessee all the way to the Mississippi River. I preached in every county and I've never experienced a lot, but I've experienced being made fun of. Uh, uh, I've experienced uh, gestures. <laughs> and uh, I've experienced people uh, screaming and cussing at me just to shut up. But, you know, in our country, thankfully now, that's about as far as they can go. That wasn't the situation then. They could do what they wanted to and really, Paul and Silas was on their turf. 
They were in their city. They were doing, they were, in other words, pretty much invaders to that area and they didn't want them there. So they literally ripped them naked. You know, we skim through the Bible and sometimes I, for, I think uh, we forget to take the full, the, the full uh, indication, the, the full uh, power of the scriptures. But listen, I don't know anybody who wants to run around naked in the middle of the court square. Do you? That's what, that was the situation they were put in. Why? Because they were preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Simply because they were naming the name of Jesus. Then they were beat. Uh, uh, Paul, during the end of his ministry, said, I've been, I've received 40 stripes, saved one five times. 39 stripes, beating five separate times. This is one of them. And none of us has experienced that. None of us really probably have any more have never even pulled a nail for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But these people did, and, and they were being oppressed for it. And uh, multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates went off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, uh, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who? having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in stocks. Now, you don't have to, you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> uh, but it, have you ever been arrested? I've been fearful if something happened. I was, I was a boy. Uh, me and some kids were... Uh, down at the old W.T. Thomas school, I was, I was in high school by then, and we thought with Halloween night, we was going to toilet paper the school. And we started, and here come Leonard Cossatunas. He's the, he was our only police officer in, I mean, in Cumberland City at the time. He, I'm not kidding, he was this tall. And he probably weighed 400 pounds. He was the, one of the biggest men I've ever saw. And, uh, First thing he said was, Lafferty, you want to go to jail? And uh, I said, no, no, sir. I mean, what are you going to say? Uh, and he wasn't going to arrest us, but he made us believe he was. You see what I'm saying? I was fearful. Now, these men were put in the very center, no windows, no way out, just the gate the door and they were locked up and they put them in, in, in the stock so that they would be locked. How would you feel? Now the only reason I ask if you've ever been locked up is because you know better how it feels than me. Because I, I, I've never experienced that. But it has to be discouraging. It, it, it has to be a feeling of complete out of control that you have no control over your own person. And, and, and so we see that that was the situation they were put. And so how would you feel? What would you do? You've been beat, you've been thrown into stocks and in the inner prison, and how would you feel to that? Well, I don't know, but I think I would have to contemplate it, don't you? How do I feel? now? probably at least nine hours that they had been in the stocks. The evening prayer time was at three o'clock, and if you remember at the beginning of our text, it said that they were going down to pray. From three in the afternoon to midnight, nine hours. That's a long time, don't you think? When you got locked up and feet's in stocks and can't go to the bathroom. You know, I always, uh, I don't know, you know, TV, but usually in TV, the little, the little cell is there and the toilet's in there with them. I'm like, how would you like to go to the toilet and everybody in the rest of the room be open? Uh, I think it would be embarrassing, don't you? But I guarantee you this, eventually you'd go, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. and, and so we, we see that they were in a hard situation. 
But you know what got to them? What got them to the point where they began to think about the goodness of God? Nine hours later, they began to praise the Lord Jesus Christ. They began to pray. You know what? I bet old Paul said, yeah, this is a mess, Silas, but I remember I was on my way to tear up the church and uh, the Lord intervened on the road to Damascus. He, he, he made a difference in my life. You know what? For those of us that are saved, He intervened one day, and if you don't have a, a time where He intervened and stopped you in your tracks, and save your soul. Uh, dear friend, make your calling and election sure this morning. Because no, I didn't see the Lord Jesus Christ. I wasn't knocked down on the road to Damascus. But I know this. He saved my never dying soul. And that's exactly what happened. And they got happy. And you know what? It wasn't too long before they started singing. <laughs> and uh, the Lord came down at midnight. Shook the place up real good. And they could have they could have fled, but they didn't. And you know the rest of the story. The Lord saved the jailer. And uh, no doubt there was a good church established there. Uh, there was victory over persecution. It was victory over oppression literally being locked up and oppressed in the middle of the prison, God came down and relieved them of their oppression and they could move and do as they pleased. One last place and we're going to close. Uh, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 4. Uh, beginning in the first verse. 2 Timothy chapter 4, in the first verse, the Bible says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Uh, two separate comings, two separate judgments. He reminds Paul of this. Preach the word. Peter at least thinks he's fixing to leave. And the only thing that he can tell Timothy to do is keep preaching the word. Uh, one day I'll be gone. I trust the Lord to send you a great pa pastor. But if one thing you ask him, will you preach the word? You don't need a children's church. You need somebody that will preach the word. And... and Paul reminds Timothy of this. Preach the word. Be instant or ready. In season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. With all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. You know uh, why the doctrine of election is hated so much? Because it's sound doctrine. It's a salvation based on God and not based on us. And so it's hated. It, it, it is not something that is loved. People will not endure that anymore. Come out from among them and be separate. Look like Christians. Act like Christians. Present like Christians. Not popular doctrine anymore. But after their own lust, they'll show heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their hearts from the two truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. You be very, very watchful. Look around you. Be aware. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Now, what does... It, to endure afflictions, what has to happen? Afflictions must come. So that will happen. Don't be stressed. Don't be worried. But are you going to take it like Paul and Silas in the jail cell? Or are you going to get the hubby grubbies over it? Endure affliction. That is what we are given to do. For I am now ready to be offered. You know what? I believe Paul was feeling depressed, don't you? 
Did Paul go this way? Eventually, yes, he lost his head. But he was, he was he'd been oppressed. He was being discouraged by Satan himself. Paul knew from the beginning how it was going to end. And we do too if we believe the word of God. Listen, we're going to die one way or the other. We know that. But when we become oppressed by it, that's when the difficulty arises. And that's, Paul was being oppressed by the devil. This wasn't just his final address to, uh, to Timothy. In fact, Timothy did make it to him and got to encourage him later. But right now, Paul was down and out and ready to quit. I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. Uh, you know, sometimes people, I know this from 30 years of nursing, sometimes people do know when they're going. Very much, I will assure you of that. I'll tell you this story and I'll move on. Miss Sophie Wilson, I know three of you in here remember Miss Sophie. She lived to be 106. Uh, on her 106th birthday, I was working 3 to 11 at the nursing home over here. And uh, I was in there helping feed the residents and I said, happy birthday, Miss Sophie, and I kissed her on the cheek, and she said, well, thank you, Larry. And uh, she goes, I, I, I'm not going to be here long. I said, oh, Miss Sophie. I said, you'll see 107. She said, no, I won't. She was dead three days later. Mm -hmm. See, sometimes I know. But you know what? The majority of us don't. The majority of us don't have a heads up. And you know what? Paul didn't either. What convinced him that he was near death? The oppression. The oppression. He had no idea, and you don't either. Well, what convinces us, convinces us of that is the demonic oppression that's constantly around us and vying for us and trying to discourage us and we allow it many times. We, we, we say, yeah, that's okay. For I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. How are you feeling this morning? I believe we all get in that same situation. Do you not? Sometimes I think, <laughs> we see that only old people get depressed. Or, or we think that maybe, you know, it's just a young person's thing because the age which we live in. No, oppression will come to every one of us. Oppression is the science of the devil. And he will bring it and he will put you down. <sighs> But what will be your response? Are you going to start singing? I'd like to think that I would. I can't sing much, but if he's oppressing me by myself, I'll be okay. All right? So I ask you, what, what are you going to do in that time? Are you going to approach the Lord with prayer? Well, what will be your plan? Because certainly, you know what? I, the situation that we find with Paul... A man that literally was next to God like we can't imagine, and he was unprepared. So I think it would be wise for us to be prepared, don't you? When oppression comes, how's your prayer life? When oppression comes, how's your knowledge of the Word of God? When oppression comes, whom can you approach for prayer? That's a person that's ready for the oppression, don't you think? And I think every one of us should.